Are you familiar with the term thin place? Perhaps it's a phrase you've heard or used yourself to describe a place where you feel close to the divine, where the the boundary between you and the holy is somehow even thinner than before, where you can feel God's presence more palpably than any other time and place. It's probably no surprise, then, that the places most often referred to as thin are where natural beauty and God's work meet. For long entrenched Episcopalians, you can think of places like Glory Ridge or Canuga, both in western North Carolina. For real church nerds, you can think of Sewanee, the Episcopal University and Seminary in Southeast Tennessee, and a place that is really close to home, Mount Lebanon Chapel in Airly Gardens, where many of our parishioners are worshiping this morning, and where I officiated a wedding yesterday afternoon. Some of us find a closer connection to God in other kinds of spaces and places, thin places that are often referred to by a different name, holy spaces, houses of worship, cathedrals and churches, including here in this space and place that is our St. James Parish Church. And so I, I wonder, what is it about these in places, these natural wonders, these houses of worship that make them sacred places and sacred ground. Today, in our reading from 1 Kings, we hear about the dedication of another holy space and sacred ground, a place that for the people of Israel was the most holy space of all, the temple a place literally built to be holy, to be set aside for the purpose of the Holy of Holies, for housing the Ark of the Covenant itself to literally contain God and God's promise. If any building were sacred and any place thin, it was here. And yet we hear in Solomon's prayer these words. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. From its very dedication, we hear King Solomon acknowledge the reality that even this place which he had built to be a house of God could never contain a God whose presence expands beyond even the highest heaven. And if that is so, why have a temple? When I was growing up, I was really a big fan of architecture. I loved drawing. I loved drawing houses. But what I especially loved to draw, what really caught my eye were sacred spaces, and especially churches, probably because I was around it all the time, but I loved drawing churches more than anything else, fascinated by cathedrals, Gothic cathedrals, English cathedrals, French, and and everything else. And perhaps it's because I, I found an attachment to the beauty that I saw in them. I did love architecture after all, but I think maybe why I liked these the most was because it There was a little bit more to it than that, something that I even connected with when I came to a sacred space. And one of the places I love drawing the most is one of the most famous of all, Notre Dame. If you heard me preach at Mount Lebanon Chapel two weeks ago, you would have heard me speak of my also attachment to watching this year's Summer Olympics in Paris. And... As a part of the opening ceremony and in days thereafter, seeing the scaffolding on the famous Cathedral of Notre Dame reminded me 
not only of this, the wonderful resurrection that's happening with that space, but what led to that. And that is the tragic fire that so many of us witnessed consume that historic space just a few years ago. Burning the roof, tearing down the spire, and leaving a gaping hole in its vaulted ceiling. As a lover of sacred spaces and having grown up drawing this space as a kid, I was particularly taken aback by the horrific videos and images, hoping that this sacred monument would not be lost forever. Even as I watched and reflected on that tragic moment, I thought to myself, what is it that I am grieving? Is it the loss of a cultural icon? The devastation of a beautiful Gothic structure I had drawn in my youth but never seen myself? The loss of a magnificent piece of history? Just sentimentality? Probably all of those things, to be honest. But for a community of faithful, this was a house of worship, a place that they encountered and were fed by our living God week after week, and a place where countless others had experienced the same for generations, where others, even visitors, even those who had never visited, were drawn closer to God by its presence. That's what makes a space and a place sacred. It's not merely its artistic beauty. It's not the stone and stained glass. Not even the beautiful wood-carved altar like we have here. Not even the, the cedar trees, the flowing water or mountain vistas. Even the beauty and artistry is a gift from God. It's what happens in a place. From the very intentional act of building up or setting aside a place for worship, of coming together for the explicit purpose of relationship with one another, and together, relationship with God. The reason sacred spaces are often beautiful spaces, though not always, is not simply for the sake of beauty, but in order to reflect the beautiful and sacred that happens within them, which most of all is our communion with God. It is that very communion which Jesus again tells us about today. For the last four Sundays, and five if you include the feeding of the 5,000, we've heard a lot about bread. We've heard segment after segment of what is known as the Bread of Life Discourse. So if you've been here the past four or five weeks, and really good job if you have, I can understand if maybe you've had your fill of bread, figuratively and literally. But as Jay Sidebotham wisely noted last week in his sermon at Mount Lebanon Chapel, we hear it week after week at this time and this uh, middle year of the three-year cycle because it is important. It, it's important because it shows us the fullness and depth of how we are to receive Jesus, not just with our ears or our eyes or our minds or our hearts. We are to literally consume Jesus such that he is within us and nourishes us and is a part of us. We consume Jesus in our worship, in our prayer. We consume with the words of Scripture. As one of, our, one of our wonderful colleagues says, grant us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. And we consume literally Jesus at God's table when we receive the bread and the wine. In all of this, we consume of God's love for us, and we are united fully 
with all that God has done for us and ultimately in Jesus Christ. And we do all of this not alone. We do all of this in community. And wherever that happens, from our most beautiful beaches to our awesome mountains, from buildings like Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, and also from the street corner to the shelter, from the broken homes to the prisons. Wherever that happens, it becomes sacred ground. Because wherever our relationship with God is deepened, we might say that it feels a little bit thinner, a bit more sacred. Just as it was for King Solomon many generations ago, so it is still true for us, even as God cannot be contained, our sacred places and sacred grounds are important places. And that makes them a gift from God. Still, as those well-versed in biblical history would know, this temple which we hear Solomon dedicate was later destroyed. And yet, God remained, and the community of faith continued, as it does today and as it always will. God will always remain and always will be with us, because our spaces, our most wonderful spaces and places, are merely vessels of something far deeper and more enduring. They are those places where we intentionally or unintentionally encounter and feast on God, where we can find strength and courage, comfort and peace, love and faithfulness to meet whatever joys and challenges we endure. Perhaps that's why you're here today. But regardless of what brought you here, do now, as Jesus tells us, feast. Feast on Jesus in our sacred places and thinnest places like our very church here and our chapel. Feast on Jesus who feeds us more deeply than anything else can. Feast such that wherever you go and take the love of God with you, you will make that space even thinner and that ground even more sacred. That is why, after all, we come to our thin places and sacred spaces to be closer to God, to be fed, sustained, even empowered, to show God into every place and space that we go. Because, as Solomon said, even while dedicating the temple, not even the highest heaven can contain you, not even this house that I have built. So I pray today that you go from this space filled up with God so that you are not only fed yourself, but so that you can't even contain yourself from showing God's grace and love God's peace and joy and making sacred ground of everywhere you go. For as our psalmist today proclaims, and our choir sang for us, 
Happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you.